speak to my heart, O God, which I abbreviate all the time to just simply say, speak, God. <laughs> it's like, okay, God, you got my attention. It's like the commercials they used to say that somebody spoke and everybody listens. When God speaks, nobody listens. <laughs> if we did, it would be so much simpler. Life would be a lot easier. So many more people would be content because then, you know, they would walk with the living God who created this world not to be a challenge, but to be rather a blessing. But people tend to make it for what they want it to be. And sometimes, no matter what you gave them, my mother used to say, wouldn't be happy if they were hung with a new rope. <laughs> but for me, simple things like a Pepsi or a spending time with my God. That's delicious. Or thinking about how God is going to reveal himself to you and to me through his word. <laughs> It's like, okay, now what are you going to show me? And I get excited about it. Just like I do when I go, oh man, I froze the Pepsi, cool. And then Susan Thaws is like, oh, that's going to be so good. And it is. Yum. And for all you health nuts, tough. <laughs> When the world looks appealing, like Pepsi, <laughs> why does life have to be so hard? Life is hard, and the world's way out is often very appealing. We're tempted, tempted on every hand. People, even many who profess to know Christ, are weakening. And the aftermath is horrible and destructive to the church, to our nation, to our homes, and to our individual lives. Listen. I can't believe God wants me to be so miserable. Surely he doesn't want me to be unhappy. Besides, I've had enough. No one can be expected to take what I've taken. I give up. I'm getting out. I'm calling it quits. And so over one half of the marriages in this decade will end in divorce because someone can't take it anymore. They just want to be happy. It doesn't matter that in their pursuit of happiness, they have traumatized the lives of their mate and their children. And to justify his or her action, one partner demeans and verbally wounds the other or their children, telling them that it's all their fault. Or in some strange and perverted twist of scripture, they will bring God in as an advocate to support their sin. And so the family buries their heads in their pillows, wetting them with tears until eventually they go to sleep. And so the mother has to go to work to support the family, or the abandoned father has to fulfill the role of the mother before he leaves for work. And so the children grow up with one parent, one important role model, missing, missing in action. Often they, in turn, will accept divorce as the reasonable solution to unhappiness because commitment, perseverance, and endurance have not been modeled for them. And then how will they live? But I loved him, he wanted me. We got carried away, but it's all right. We're in love. Besides, everyone's doing it. And so she loses her virginity, the one unique gift she could have given her husband. And so they had an affair, not believing or knowing that whoever commits fornication sins against his or her own body. And so she had an abortion, no sense in bringing an unwanted child into the world. And so the seventh commandment is broken. And to cover up that one, the sixth commandment is broken. If happiness isn't sought through relationships, it may be sought through things. If I only had that, I'd be happy. I'd be successful. I'd be appealing. At least that is what the media tells us every day. And the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life watch and listen to the ads, to the advertisements, to the appeal of things, to the appeal of success, to the appeal of power, to the appeal of changing your personal image, to the appeal of appealing you. We're tempted on every hand. The world is appealing. Life is hard. Life is full of disappointments, discouragements, defeats, difficulties. God's word calls these trials. And God says that trials are for our good. They are intended to make us more like Jesus. 
But the flesh wants none of this. The flesh doesn't want trials. The flesh doesn't want to suffer or endure hardship. And so with every trial, there is also the potential of sin, the potential of yielding to the flesh connection that you and I have, the potential of yielding to temptation that we are all tempted by. Listen to the word of God. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one, when he is tempted, when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. James 1, 13-15 Whenever we choose not to endure in righteousness, but to give way to the flesh instead, there is a tendency either to blame our circumstances or to blame someone else. It couldn't have been our fault. When God confronted Adam with his sin, Adam blamed God for giving Eve to him. Eve blamed the serpent. Neither of them said, God, I sinned. I yielded to the lust of my eyes for I saw the fruit and desired it. I yielded to the pride of life, for I knew it would make me wise. God, I was wrong, but I took it. When you sin, James says, you cannot blame God. God cannot be tempted by evil, and he tempts no one to do evil. Nor can you blame the devil. The devil did not make you do it. He cannot. Oh, the devil delights to see you sin, but you can't put the blame on him. You cannot say, oh, the devil made me do it. God says that you sin because you allowed yourself to be carried along by your own lusts, by your own pride, by your own flesh, by your own decision. Satan is the tempter, not the actor. But he cannot do a thing without your cooperation. You have to participate. The problem is within, inside you. Unbridled lust, which lures you from the obedience to the word of God, and when lust conceives, it gives birth to sin. The sin kills whatever it touches. Not necessarily physical death. It may be the death of a marriage, the death of a relationship, an opportunity, a ministry, virginity, innocence. Sin kills whatever it touches. In one way or another, it is like cancer. It affects and deteriorates that cell membrane that once was you. I have heard countless teens testify to what has happened to a generation whose parents had yielded to temptation. Our nation and our homes are doomed to destruction by self-destruction unless we learn to bridle our lusts by walking in obedience to the word of God. Unless we determine to do without and to suffer and even to die rather than disobey. Much of this failure is a result of the fact that people either do not know or do not understand the Word of God, or they know and understand but choose not to obey. Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. 1 Corinthians 10.12 We must watch and pray, remembering that no temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you will be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The reality of our salvation experience was summed up in some very few words that I think also sums up the reality of our failure as Christians. And it's very simple. And it's very profound because you use it on other people all the time. Maybe. You've seen it written, I'm sure, and you know what I'm about to say, possibly. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Do you think Jesus did what he wanted to do? Or did he choose to do what the Father wanted him to do, and then delighted in doing it? You see, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus was not meant to be before you get saved and then all of a sudden now that you're born again you're free to do anything you want to because all things are lawful to me but not all things are expedient so I can get away with it you can't you are being held accountable and responsible maybe not to God the Father 
for judgment, but you will be to Jesus. And at some point in time, there is a place where even God himself said he would not cross grace, and that we find ourselves outside of the place that God said he would not go. And if you do that, then you will find yourself in the place where God has condemned all those that he would not save. So the point is, it is better to deal with ourselves honestly and say, yes, I blew it, I sinned, I know I did, than to try to deny the fact that you are in sin at some point in time and run and hide and make up excuses and deny the fact that you caused others also to sin. Take care of yourself, please, and leave everyone else alone. Deal with you one-on-one -on -one with God and quit trying to fix other people because the sin that you see in others first begins in you. It's only made manifest more so by how you judge another person rather than how you forgive another person. For if you have mercy unto them, you will be given mercy. And if you see a sin in another, then take it to God in prayer and put yourself in their shoes and pray that it's your sin that be forgiven. Because if you can receive this, that's what God sees.